Hi, welcome to the Future of Democracy, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. I'm your host, Sam Gill. You gotta think of the show as the op-ed page of our contemporary democracy. It's where we hear uh, different views, uh, different debates um, about some of the really critical issues um, that are challenging our democracy or that are showing the way forward. And we're gonna continue to talk this week about social media and democracy. Um, there is a growing sense that social media has at least become a friendly haven to, if not accelerant of hate speech and other discriminating forms of expression. And this summer, the most successful ad ban in history, Stop Hate for Profit, convinced major brands, including Unilever, Ford, and Coca-Cola, to pull ads for 30 days from Facebook. Our guest today helped orchestrate the campaign. Uh, he's no stranger to pressuring corporations around social issues. Um, he's Rashad Robinson, the president of Color of Change, and I'm really excited that we'll have a chance to talk to him, not only about this campaign and why it was so uniquely successful, but how he sees uh, the work continuing um, in, in seeking to change the role that social media plays in our democracy. So please join me in welcoming to the show, Rashad Robinson. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good to see you, Sam. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Of course. So let's start um, with, we've now got a little bit of the benefit of hindsight, um, which I think there's sort of some good and some bad in thinking about this campaign, but let's start with the good. I mean, this really was, this wasn't the first ad moratorium um, for one of the major platforms. It was easily the most successful and the most visible. Um, why, what do, you, what do you think made this work um, this year? Well, a couple of things I think it made it work. First of all, the timing. We were in a moment where there were an unprecedented number of eyes looking at screens and major corporations and brands were asking what they could do around racial justice and racial equality. Um, corporations had been reaching out to us. They were making statements and then they were watching um, as uh, Facebook um, was allowing for hate and division to be sold on its platform. These corporations had their own challenges also with Facebook. They were dealing with a company that did not have to make changes because they didn't have competitors. And so as a result, uh, many of these companies felt in this weird kind of catch 22 in their relationship with, um, or kind of rock in a hard place in their relationship with Facebook. And so it was the perfect sort of set of all those things, but really for us uh, as the social justice organizations and particularly for us at Color of Change, which have been battling Facebook for since 2015 and had been over time working to push this company to do various things, had been on the inside pushing, had went before and pushed Congress and, um, and legislators to do things, had been constantly trying to make movement. The boycott and the ban represented sort of us as like a final straw, really recognizing that we, if we didn't bring more public attention and more public awareness to the issue, we would continue to spin our wheels with a company that wasn't incentivized to change. And what do you think the campaign achieved? You had a lot of access in some key moments, um, were you able to extract concessions that you and your uh, your allies see as meaningful? So yeah, I mean, a couple of things. So first, you know, we at Color of Change had demanded that Facebook do a civil rights audit, and we had and we'd gotten them to commit to doing a civil rights audit after um, they had turned off the Facebook Live of a black woman in Baltimore who was having a police interaction. Uh, they turned it, uh, police asked Facebook to turn it off without any proper sort of protocols. They turned it off. She ended up dead. Her name is Kareem Gaines. And what ends up happening is we demand that they do a civil rights audit and as they're asking what they can do. And then they start kind of what Facebook oftentimes does is they say they're going to do something and then it doesn't actually happen. And when Mark goes before Congress the first time, we work with Senator Booker to have him ask specifically about the civil rights audit and civil rights issues. At that point, Mark does commit to doing the civil rights audit now publicly in a more public forum before the United States Senate. But what ends up happening is once again, more slow walking, more pushing. And then the New York Times reveals that Facebook, while this was happening, had hired a PR firm to attack us. Um, we found out because the New York Times called us after they had published a story to get comment. And so we're now trying to sort of navigate this. This ends up with us moving from meetings at the policy and staff level to meeting, moving to meetings at the C-suite level. And in our first sort of face-to-face -face sit down with Cheryl, 
Sandberg, the COO, where Mark stopped in for a little while, we get Cheryl to commit to uh, releasing the civil rights audit publicly. And later that month, they released the first phase of the civil rights audit, which really showed the company, um, um, to no surprise, um, hadn't done much. They hadn't actually done much on that audit. They were slow walking. So it was a bunch of things that they would do, not things that they had done, even though the audit had been apparently taking place for about a year. And then over the course of the next six months, I will be honest and say that Facebook um, really did lean in. Um, I mean, pun intended in some ways. Cheryl took over the, um, took over the audit and she was in deep contact. I was in regular contact with her in her office. We brought her to Atlanta to meet with uh, Black activists and activists from the Muslim and Jewish and other communities to hear firsthand about the impacts of this platform. We got them, they started making announcements around banning white nationalist groups, around um, sort of political ads. And right before that sort of forum in Atlanta, um, their policy director announces um, almost what seemed like a surprise to Cheryl and her team that they were going to have an exemption to some of these policies, particularly on political speech. Um, and hey, you know, and so we started to call it the Donald Trump exemption. We were surprised. We had put all this time in having this form, and then we were sort of blindsided the day before. And this, but we kept, we stayed at the table once again. So this, now we've been publicly attacked. Then we like do this forum and we've been sort of kind of uh, publicly surprised. But at each turn, we're continuing to push because we don't have the government levers to actually get the type of oversight and, um, and enforcement necessary. And so we know that we actually need to do some things so we don't end up in the same position as we were in 2016 around the election and how the platform was used uh, to weaponize all sorts of uh, attempts to suppress the vote against Black communities. So we continue to work and we continue to get policies in place and we continue in these back and forth meetings. And then Donald Trump starts testing these policies, um, whether it was the voter suppression policy, whether it was the policy about inciting violence. So whether it was lying about voting um, and vote by mail, whether it was that looters and shooters post at the height of the George Floyd uprisings, we watch as Facebook doesn't enforce the policies that they had put in place, that at every turn they find a reason why they can't enforce it and the policies go through, the, the decision to enforce it goes through their policy department, which is charged with maintaining a relationship in uh, DC, which is very different than the way that those decisions are made at Twitter and Google and other places around uh, these decisions. And so we had been in a lot of back and forth. And in June 1st, um, along with Cheryl and Eiffel from the Legal Defense, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and Vanita Gupta from the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, I met with Mark, uh, Cheryl, uh, Joe Kaplan, who uh, is kind of Brett Kavanaugh's best friend and was the policy director. We met over Zoom around these posts. And at the end of the meeting, I knew that the work that my team had been doing around building out what could look like an ad boycott was the only way to go. Because once again, we're on this call and we're being uh, sort of explained civil rights by Mark Zuckerberg about why these things don't violate the policies, about why they shouldn't be enforced, about why it wasn't a mistake. And I realized that we weren't in the right conversation, that we were asking for someone to do something that wasn't incentivized to do it. And we needed to make this conversation much more public. We needed to move it out of the behind the scenes conversations and move it into a much more public space. And that's how we got here. And I think what we achieved, and I think what we always knew that we wanted to achieve was putting this conversation on the map in a new way, right? I did a, a set of uh, black radio this morning, specifically on the debate. And each of those conversations, they asked me about Facebook and our work around Facebook. That did not happen six months ago. This is on the radar of people in a new way as a result of over a thousand brands joining us. Social justice warriors and big corporations who no one would call social justice warriors coming together to say this platform has to do something different. Them not doing something different, them continuing to lean like, like kind of defend their positions, even while they made some modest changes um, at the edges, I think also sends a powerful message in a new conversation. Just yesterday, the report came out or 
this week, the report came out from uh, Congress on antitrust. And I did a, a press conference with Congressman Cicilline, the, the, the chair of the subcommittee. And in each of these places, those, this kind of campaign, this stop pay for profit campaign is actually being used as an example, another talking point, another sort of line to show why real reform um, and real change is necessary. Well, I, I would agree. I mean, I think, I think that if to the extent that success is about, I think one bringing to the surface in corporate speak concerns about brand safety and making that part of the political discussion, I, I, I would agree that the campaign did that. And I certainly agree with you that something that's definitely shifted um, over the past six months is that the, the discussion about content, the, the lawyers like to call kind of lawful but awful, is now a lot more specific. We're, we're talking in part about content that is lawful but racist, lawful but hateful. And that's different than awful in a generalized way. It's different than, I just don't like the tone of the discourse online. I think the recognition that, um, that there are some communities who are victimized in a much more fundamental and pervasive way by the speech, that the internet's being instrumentalized for that purpose has made a difference. And of course, you know, COVID has made a difference too. I think, I think, I think a sort of corporate liturgy around unbridled free expression just feels a lot emptier in a world where it's actively difficult to find accurate information about COVID um, on social media platforms. I guess the question though is, so you've changed the discourse. We're still sort of careening toward the abyss. You know, like where do we, where do we go from here? Well, you know, this is the, this is the trick that we're in, right? We've got to win um, the right level, levers of power to be able to uh, put infrastructure in place to set new rules and to then enforce those rules. You know, one thing, uh, Facebook kept saying things that they couldn't do around enforcement, around content moderation. And I remember sort of in the early days when we're all going into quarantine, um, and there was a lot of misinformation and disinformation about COVID. You know, some people may not remember this because it feels like we've lived a couple of years over these last couple of months. But in the early days of COVID, there was a lot of disinformation online that Black people couldn't get COVID. Like black people like were somehow immune to COVID in some way. Um, and a lot of that was all related to lagging indicators around how like people had actually access to healthcare and had access to doctors. And so a lot of uh, the ways in which this conversation was being driven was um, was online and a lot of misinformation and then disinformation like you can use lupus drugs to cure COVID. And um, Black women are disproportionately more likely to have lupus. So we watch lupus drugs flying off the shelves and then people not getting access. I talked to Cheryl and what, Cheryl Sandberg, and I, one thing I was like just encouraged by and also like then a little outraged by was all of the great work that Facebook was doing to deal with misinformation and disinformation around COVID, how they had moved all of these forces, how they had coordinated. It was almost sort of like military style in terms of their ability to be able to coordinate resources and deploy resources because they saw this was a problem. They coordinated with the World Health Organizations. They did all of this work to like make sure they were dealing with this information. And she walked me through it and it was um, deeply encouraging and all I could think was this was the same stuff that she told me they couldn't do, like technically, just a couple of months before, which is just a recognition of power, right? Of where, of how incentive structures work inside of corporations. What people tell you they can do is oftentimes not actually what they can do, but what they will do, what they are willing to sacrifice, what they're willing to put on the line. And even, you know, two hours before the debate, I was in communication with, you know, senior level people at Facebook um, about the Donald Trump Jr. post on Facebook that calls for an enlistment of an army of Trump supporters to deal with voter fraud yeah. um, that is happening. I, I, I tried to help them the same way that I did around that looters and shooters post. Also point this back to the history of vigil anti um, sort of attacks on black communities, the suppression of black people's political voice, the violence that we have faced, that if you've read history books or seen documentaries is as clear as day. Um, and I got an email back a couple of hours before Donald Trump uh, was on a national stage telling the Proud Boys to stand by, defending and parsing enlist 
and army and what he really meant. Um, and knowing full well that if we had the right level of power, I wouldn't be in that conversation. They are more afraid right now of regulation and attacks from the administration than they are of the impacts of their platforms on the safety of our communities. And until we build the right level of power, whether it's through government or whether it's through commerce or whatever else, and commerce is deeply hard when you have a monopoly, um, we are gonna continue to be in this situation where we're making demands on a system mm -hmm. that are moral, righteous uh, demands where we don't have the right incentive structure because moral and righteousness um, doesn't outweigh profit and growth. What do you, so imagine that there is regime change in November in a pretty profound way. Um, if, if Democrats uh, retake the Senate and the White House, this will not be low on the list of issues, uh, technology. What, what, what are some of the rules that you think are, need to be the top priorities um, to, to ultimately begin to produce a, a, a more just social media, in your view? So a couple of things. First, um, there are agencies already that sort of have lacked the, the sort of uh, teeth and uh, to um, enforce what they should be enforcing, to oversee what they already should be doing. And so the FTC is one place um, that's dealing both with the fact that, you know, Facebook has 60%, I mean, Facebook has 75% of the messaging market. They are controlled by one person. Uh, they have, a, it's a chairperson and CEO who makes all the decisions uh, with uh, over 2.6 billion users and has more followers than Christianity. So the fact that we're using rules that, largely were created before Facebook existed to sort of keep it accountable um, doesn't mean that we have the type of muscular rules that hold it accountable. And so FTC, which has been weak, and even when it has put um, sort of um, rulings down, hasn't either been able to enforce it or has fined Facebook at the level of, you know, what, um, at the equivalent of what, you know, a piece of candy might cost my niece um, and has not actually in any way um, cost Facebook or prevented Facebook from wanting to do it again. And so, you know, what we're now dealing with is the, those agencies. But to be clear, right, we have been here before in this country where new industries had grown and consolidated and we needed infrastructure to keep us safe. You know, we don't rely on the auto industry to be the sole sort of ambassadors about whether or not the seatbelts work, but we have regulations and we have rules and we have oversight enforcement. We don't rely on our meat, on, on the meat industry alone to determine whether or not the meat that comes into our homes are safe. And so I do think, you know, similar to what's been done, you know, at the consumer level with the CFPB, we need an agency that is robust and has sort of the ability to both enforce um, rules, um, have a real civil rights perspective as it relates to new tools that come down the road. You know, we've watched as these platforms have argued that they are not accountable to civil rights law, right? So not only do they make their products um, without black and brown people in the room, then they also then go around saying that they're not accountable to civil rights law. I remember at the height of the pandemic, all of the, um, I shouldn't say the height of the pandemic, that's, that's, not really fair, but in the early days of the pandemic, um, hitting our shores here in the United States, I would, um, we were dealing with a whole host of Zoom bombing that was happening, okay. um, attacking Black and Jewish and other sort of gatherings. And when I got on the phone with, uh, and I guess I got on the Zoom with the leadership at Zoom, and they, you know, said to me, well, we would never imagine that people would want to interrupt someone's gathering. And I'm like, of course you never imagined it because you didn't have people around the table who have a history and experience with their gatherings being interrupted. And so, you know, to the extent that we need um, enforcement and rules to oversee new tools, we need accountability on it. And then we need the like right level of certification for who gets to build these tools, right? I live in New York City. There's a lot of buildings. There's a lot of people who are, who have, uh, architect or engineer in their title who built these things. And if they fail, those engineers are held accountable for the failures of what they built, for how they've hurt people. People go out to Silicon Valley 
and have the ability to build all sorts of things that impact our lives, but don't have to be accountable to any set of rules. And they don't have to be responsible if the tools that they built or the sort of infrastructure that they built hurts us. The technology that has the potential to bring us into the future shouldn't drag us into the past. What, uh, what might a certification, I mean, that's an interesting idea. What might a certification regime for, um, for this kind of engineering class uh, look like? So, I mean, I think that, you know, we certify lawyers, we certify doctors. I think that there are sort of, um, it would probably include some, some, some test and evaluation. It would include a set of ethics that people have to sort of abide by. And if they don't, there's like a, a regulatory body that sort of can, uh, you know, take their sort of uh, license or their bar certification or whatever else. The fact that we have certifications for so many different jobs, um, and right now, the future, our literal future is built by people who don't have to be certified, should make all of us worry because what we know will happen is that the capitalist forces of making money at all expense will outweigh some of the questions about safety, um, civil rights, um, that can sometimes slow things down, but actually allow for all of us to fully participate, allow for those tools not to hurt, harm, and target people. And so I do think that those are the case. I, I also want to say that there's a lot of smart people sort of talking about this and thinking about this in a range of different ways. And one thing that I'm always struck by is that when the tech companies and tech both go before Congress, how much, um, how in, and after our members of Congress can sometimes look when they're asking questions, you know, they- uh, How dare you accuse yes. our legislative body of ever being inept. <laughs> exactly, and they'll say things about, you know, an Android product when it's really an Apple product. And, you know, maybe ask, and I've, I've sometimes been in rooms where I've been like talking about sharing platforms and they, I've been, um, you know, having to just educate the lawmaker how to get on the platform and find their password. Um, but I say all that to say that, I don't expect my, the people in Congress to be necessarily experts on nuclear power. I expect us to build the infrastructure so that we do have folks that are experts. And I expect the lawmakers to recognize um, how do we evaluate their effectiveness? How do we evaluate their safety? But you know, we don't elect our elected officials to be expert on every single thing that the government um, um, has to oversee or that the things that impact our lives. What we want them to be able to do is recognize at scale the infrastructure that we need um, to ensure safety and to ensure our democracy and an economy that we can all participate in. So just to keep pushing on this a little bit, I mean, one of the things that strikes me about the examples that you gave um, which I think are great examples of places where we have, you know, both regulatory infrastructure and professional ethics. Um, in, the, in the examples of like a, a, a developer, uh, a lawyer, a doctor, absolutely there are incentives to cut corners. And so you do need professional codes that make clear what the ultimate interest is. But there's also kind of broad consensus between the practitioner and the consumer about what success looks like. Like the building standing is a success for both. The building falling is a failure for both. The patient you know, healing is success for both. The patient getting sicker or dying is a problem for both. And when I listen to say like Mark Zuckerberg when he's interviewed and asked questions about harm that might be obtaining on the platform, you know, there's still kind of a discourse that it's net beneficial, that there's sort of more good happening because we can personalize the content, because we can connect you to more people because the connection is there all the time. Um, and, and, and I can't tell you know, whether the sort of engineering class that you wanna target with the certification system actually fully embraces the idea of a, of a good social media, of a functioning social media that you're necessarily espousing. Yeah, I mean, this is all the more reason why we have to do it, right? If the industry was all on board, then we may not actually need it the same way. Um, you know, police don't actually want new rules either, uh, but we need um, systems and structures. Um, and even if there is a net benefit, right, that also can't be the sort of like um, the kind of ground in which we stop. We have to think about sort of all of the ways in which those net benefits can slowly um, be chipped away if we don't actually deal with the, the challenges um, in an increasingly diverse 
an increasingly um, divided society. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that um, a lot of folks um, in Silicon Valley want you to believe that they've designed tools that are not biased, that these tools have been designed in ways that are just sort of like, you know, building on data and data is not biased. And what I know, right, from living uptown in New York, right? Let's just talk about it at the sort of micro level of like policing, for instance, right? So I live uptown in New York, a stone's throw away from Columbia University, a stone's throw away from Central Harlem. No one can tell me that there's not just as much drugs being done on Columbia University's campus as there is in Central Harlem. But we know if we just looked at arrest records on drugs, sure. we would have a whole theory about what was happening in terms of people's drug use, right, on Columbia's campus versus in Harlem that actually then could be extrapolated into all sorts of models that tech companies use um, and it could hand off to law enforcement that could then do predictive policing, could then use those things to deny people access to housing through Airbnb, that could deny people access to credit. Could, these models were then used to um, uh, determine whether or not someone was getting marketed certain jobs or certain um, housing on Facebook until we worked through the Fair Housing Coalition, ACLU, and others to sort of push back on that. And so I say all of that to say that um, the, we will have to build some consensus, and that will be the hard work. I wish this was going to be easier than it will be. But part of the reason why we're here, right, is because we've gotten so far down the line building tools and systems without a civil rights perspective in mind, without uh, a sort of perspective about the harms and damages. And now we've got huge platforms which um, have dictate so much of our day-to-day -day lives. And these platforms are continuing to grow. And, and as a result, um, you know, so many of us are continuing to uh, face the sort of uh, damage, the consequences of their um, growth without rules. Do you see the social movement that you've started to tap into broadening? Well, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's incredible. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we did a, a brief pause with uh, um, on Instagram. Just another thing as we keep building. You know, I am not confused that we're, you know, around what we can actually do to damage Facebook's sort of like bottom line right now. They are insulated in a lot of ways that they're set up. But what we have done is we are creating broad consensus among the public. Uh, we are, um, we have given Mark Zuckerberg in these companies many of opportunities to come to the table and actually be good players in moving things forward. And I bet you if they had taken more of an opportunity to fix some of the things, it would be a lot harder for us to get so many people on board, so many companies during these campaigns, so many celebrities, so many folks on board, so many elected officials. But because of their unwillingness, because they have been so focused on growth, like, you know, like the, like the railroads of, the, of, 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 you know, days before, um, like so many of the other companies that had to be dealt with. I don't believe that we can simply take old sort of models of just breaking things up or just doing this. I do think we need new rules for a new day, but I do fundamentally believe that we need rules. And I believe that we are changing public perception. And now we have to channel that presence and that visibility and that awareness into actually changing the rules. And so that's where it gets tough. That's where we're gonna lose some people here and there. That's where um, we're gonna be in deep fights. But you know, I actually believe that the sort of uh, a multiracial democracy like ours um, is an experiment. And if we're not willing to put rules in the role that allow for our voices to be heard and for us to participate and engage, then we're not going to, then we're not serious about making this experiment work. So just a, a last question before I let you go. Um, and it's a, it's a version of a, we got a question on the chat about whether you're continuing to have dialogue with advertisers. And I guess the question would meet to me along the lines of what you just said is, you know, will, will, will brand advertisers be a force in this campaign? for change, for new rules at a threshold that will matter. Like you, you alluded to this, getting to thresholds that matter for these companies is really hard. You know, 
Once the NCAA said, we're not going to have a championship in a state with a Confederate flag, that was one state that I had to worry about it at that point, that you could reach a threshold of advertiser anxiety um, that worked. North Carolina, around the, you know, the bathroom bill, quote unquote, yeah. you were able to reach an advertiser threshold that had an impact. Do you see uh, advertisers linking arms with you uh, in, this, in this effort going forward? Um, you know, I think that this is going to be, a, but this, this remains to be seen. We're going to invite as many of the advertisers in, you know, as someone who's got um, uh, some successes and a lot of wounds from doing corporate accountability work, I never sort of, um, I never count on a whole set of companies being in the long-term game of regulation and accountability. They are all incentivized to having um rules that allow them to operate without accountability. At the same time, you know, the business to business nature of Facebook and the ways and the arrogance of this company, which has grown so large and doesn't feel like they have to listen to feedback. The fact that we could continually show big brands uh, their ads right next to uh, organizations that were calling for a second civil war, um, you know, I think did spark their energy. How far they go down the road of setting new rules remains to be seen. Um, but I do think that we are in a place uh, where we, um, where Facebook becomes the biggest champion for our efforts because continually day in and day out, they have an infrastructure that's not incentivized to set rules. And they, their business model comes directly up against the things that corporations um, and the users want. And now we've got to sort of make uh, the next steps. And I think your point about making the sort of regulations and rules matter um, is so important. The last thing we would want is to have a victory lap around a set of rules that don't change the context and experience that people are having on the platform. Well, you can follow Rashad on Twitter at Rashad Robinson. You can follow Color of Change on Twitter at Color of Change or at colorofchange.org. As always, we'll send this out to you after the show. Rashad, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate you. Thanks, Sam. All right, folks, uh, we've got some, some good shows coming up in the coming weeks on October 22nd. Uh, we'll be uh, hearing from Zainab Tufechi, uh, a professor uh, at University of North Carolina and kind of a modern Nostradamus on questions technology and COVID. Uh, on October 29th, we'll be hearing from Kristen Clark, president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. As a reminder, this episode will be up on the website later. You can see this episode and any episode on demand at kf.org slash show. You can also subscribe to the Future of Democracy podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Same show, one day later, audio only. Uh, you can email us at fdshow at kf.org, or you can uh, reach me on Twitter at the Sam Gill. Please stay for 30 seconds to take a two-question survey. We always appreciate your views. And we will end the show to the sounds of Miami singer-songwriter Nick County. You can check out his music on Spotify. Uh, until next week, thanks for joining us. Stay safe.